the biggest bang of confidence comes from, I've been consistent for 17 years, 16 years. I don't even know. And even before that we were, you know, doing the gym thing and the Stairmaster. And even before that I was doing the Reebok step and the, you know, the slide and all that stuff. So I've been active my whole life, but since triathlon and ultra running, like I've listened to my coach, I've followed the plan. I haven't really fought back on that stuff too much. Um, I've just executed and I've been consistent for almost two decades. And so, yeah, I've got the confidence that, you know, but if, if you're an athlete that's not consistent, if you're all or nothing, if you're high and low and you're going to go out and do this epic thing, your decision to go do it is not wrong. It's not wrong, but be very aware of like, there may be, there will be right. Cause and effect. We live, this is scientific law, cause and effect that there will be a cost. And so are you okay with what that cost is? Because if you're not okay with it, then you start fighting it. Then maybe you doubt the decision that you made. You think the decision was wrong. You're beating yourself up. And none of this is really moving you in that direction of, you know, come full circle in this conversation to belief in self and trust, which is monumental. It's really, really important in, in your ability to succeed. You want to get to the starting line. How can you best get to the starting line? consistency and ebbing and flowing ever so slightly, maybe going up a little bit and, and recovering and going up a little bit and recovering consistently versus having major, you know, let's just call it weekend workouts. And then you do nothing during the week. Um, really big opportunity for stuff to happen uh, in the body and show up and not allow you to get to that starting line. So I think when you loop it into racing and if racing is really something that you're, you know, you enjoy doing, wouldn't you want to do everything possible to get to that starting line? And I think what happens is, yes, you want to get to that starting line, but then we begin, the ego tends to get in there and says, well, I need to do, I need to get super strong and fit to get to that starting line. And that's where the self-regulation really comes in. Being able to understand you, maybe you don't need to do 20 100s, maybe just 10 100s are good right now and gives you enough dose of fitness to get you to the next day and the next day and the next day. Because it's this stacking day after day after day that really builds a foundation and, and you shouldn't say hardening of the body, but a, a, an awareness in the body that it can do, it can do things every day. It, it's building strength and durability. Um, and when you do the inconsistent training and you do the highs and lows, the body doesn't really know what is true and what is not true. Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. I'm Jess. I'm here with Beach. This is our monthly O show, the open and honest show. We're not quite sure what we're going to be throwing down today, but um, we're going to do it truthfully. Satya. In yoga, we call it satya, truthfulness. Um, but what trumps truthfulness, BJ? Love. Non, nonviolence. Nonviolence. Love. Yeah. So for those of you who have never had a problem with uh, direct communication, you know, telling the truth, we need to look at, you know, if that heart is open, because sometimes truth can really hurt. So we don't want to, we don't want to hurt people. Um, all right. That's a little lesson in the yamas, which are the two of the ethical guiding principles of yoga. So here we are. It's March. Is it March? It's March. It's March. Yep. And we just got back in from the pool and we had that like, do we take a nap? Do we grab a coffee? Do we take a nap? Do we walk the dogs? Grab a coffee. Do we take a nap? Do we do both? What do I do? Decaf, latte, what? We chose a walk downtown with Clark and his best friend, Rumi, and uh, Dr. Laura. And uh, now we're here throwing down a podcast. We still have Coach Liz in town. She's been in town now for a couple of weeks, so we're actually going to go out and catch the sunset with her at a fancy schmancy resort on the water after this. And, um, yeah. Welcome and Daniel's to- out in yeah, Coach Arizona Daniel. for Ultraman. So cool. Yeah. Well, he's not racing, but he's supporting his buddy, Furby. 
So cool. Yeah. So cool that he gets these opportunities and he just keeps saying yes. And um, I just love it. I love, I love these coaches. We have such an amazing team and we're in the first week of the Awake Kitchen 30-Day Jumpstart Nutrition Program with plant-based chef and health coach Linda Lang Tama and uh, it's off to a great start. So excited to see what's going to unfold over the rest of the month and then also she's got a plan to continue through April and some of the folks who are already signed up are excited for that to, to continue on and really, you know... Sometimes in life, we just got to say like, this is it. Like, this is the time that I'm going to do it and really make good on it. Do you remember a time where you made a change like that, Paige? A big epic change? Yeah, like when you're just like, okay, I've been like, I've been a gerbil on the wheel. I've, I've tried to do this. I think a lot of people could probably relate to this in like weight loss, right? Like, I'm going to do it on Monday. I'm going to do it at the beginning of the year. Like, I'm going to try it again. But a time in your life where you just really were craving a change and you were like, all right, this is it. Like, I'm going to do it and I'm going to stick with it this time. Oh, man, that's such a, wow. I'm trying to think. The first thing that comes to mind is my, my perspective on preparing for uh, presentations or, or going in for my review, my yearly review with my boss and getting all worked up about it and preparing and practicing and you know, what if I, am I going to, if I say this, will it, will it allow me to make more Would you offer me more or like, <laughs> it was just such a, um, all consuming experience. And when I finally, finally just let it go, meaning I didn't, it's not that I didn't care. I had no attachment to the outcome. I realized I just love what I do. Whatever is presented to me in this review is a gift. I'm in, amazing appreciation and gratitude for just being able to be here. And after that, things just got so much easier. So I guess that epic moment is like, I don't, I don't get all, I, I don't get myself all worked up about, you know, what, saying the right thing or doing the right thing. I just feel into me and it's much more easeful. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. Because you spent, you spent many years before, like, you know, in nervous preparation yeah, for experiences like that. Yeah. And would, so there was a point where you were like, okay, that, that doesn't really feel that great. It doesn't. It doesn't. It creates like ickiness inside. <laughs> yeah. That's a good word that I use. So ickiness, but I really have embraced it. And uh, from that experience, I've embraced a lot of that through other facets of my life now too. A lot more easeful yeah. versus controlling. I guess that's a controlling thing, right? I want to control the outcome of this uh, review. Yeah. I want to set all the steps up possible so that I know as much as I can going into that thing. Um, but now I just go in. Well, I don't have reviews. But um, I go into uh, um, experiences or, or or even camp, you know, being in front of people just with an open, welcoming energy that says the words will come to me, everything will come in the in the perfect time. Don't sweat the small stuff. And realizing that they're probably more nervous um, on their end than I would be on mine because tables have turned. When I would go to camps, you know, I would be that person that's like, oh my god, what are they thinking about me? Am I am I good enough? Am I you know, am I going to be able to keep up the paces? And so it's kind of turned and everyone's all consumed. Yeah. Their own isn't that funny? I'm glad you brought story. that up. Yeah. Like with camp, we don't necessarily feel the worry from athletes about being too fast for camp. It's all about being like, I don't want to slow the group down. And, and isn't that kind of the same energy that you were moving from as you prepared for these reviews and things is this like base level, like I'm not good enough kind of thing, which I think it's so cool what we do as endurance athletes because we set these goals and, you know, we show up, we do the work um, as best we can with the tools we have and, um, and we achieve those goals. And I think that there's got to be a byproduct of that. That's just, we get confidence from what we do as athletes. Repetition over yeah. and over and over again. Now, this is the thing that we do in giving workouts similar workouts week after week, or maybe modifying things or coming into a full cycle 
of workouts. So we won't see a workout. Maybe maybe we'll see it every fourth or sixth week uh, as like a, a, a test or a gauge as to how athletes are performing. But it's that repetition over and over and over and over <laughs> again so that you build confidence. And that's, yeah. And just the way that our bodies are wired and our brains are wired, like we're going to, we're going to get that memory in there, which is going to be familiar, which is going to be confident because it's going to be certainty. And I think the battle, yeah, certainty, the mind craves that certainty. But I think the massaging of that, that experience is the mind saying I should be going faster where the workout dictates you just need to hit this time over and over again right now. So the mind is saying, oh, but I already hit those times. I'm going to try and go faster. But the confidence in, in my opinion is repeating that workout at that time over and over and over again until the time when you're ready to bump it up to the next whatever interval that is, if we're talking about swimming or running or actually biking, whatever it is, so that we have this foundation that we've been successful over and over and over again. It's like the many small wins that Michael Phelps always talks about over and over. Like how many wins can you accumulate? And we're, we're just saying, let's get a lot of wins doing this one particular workout on one particular set. So things are constantly repeating and then confidence because you know you can do it. You know, the mind knows there's the certainty. It knows it can do it. And I, in that piece of like, well, I can run faster than this. Like that's self-regulation. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's self-control. Yeah. Which is so important, so important self-control. Well, it's, it's that it's, I think that self-control is like getting into that space between stimulus and response, right? So you set up your bike and the day before the race and you, everything's like perfect and, and you do all the things and you put your trash bag on your bike seat, which BJ and I can't figure out because aren't you wet when you get on the bike? If somebody can help us with that, I know there's probably a reason. We've asked this before though. Somebody said when we were at Malibu, it's because of sand. But on your bike seat, I don't get that. But yeah, on bike seats, I'm not quite sure. So then you get you go for a practice swim and you come back and somebody's like knocked your bike down and you know your nutrition's everywhere and there's a scratch on it. Like what is like what is that reaction? Is it like really feeling into the essence of that? Because that can be a huge expenditure of energy that's unnecessary. That when harnessed through training the mind and being in self-control, you can harness that energy. You can keep that energy inside, let it build, let it build. I mean, feel what you're feeling. I'm not saying deny what you're feeling, but like watch how far down the road into that reaction, into the uh, engagement of the commentary about it, you go. Because there's a point where it just becomes gratuitous energy expenditure that, you know, it's just... It's not helpful for racing. It's not helpful for your future because that feeling that you're going down the road with is, you know, your point of attraction and what you're creating in that moment for the future. And at the base level, the reaction that you have, does it feel good? Like, don't we want to feel good? And if that Mm. stirs up anger or... uh, uh, there's been a wrongdoing against me, right? And and you get that that heightened level. It, does it make you feel good? That's one thing I really uh, have been focusing on. Like, does it make me feel good? And if it doesn't make me feel good, there's got to be there's got to be a way to release that and move it up and out of my my body or my feeling or or really what I'm trying to say is understand the emotion that's up, feel it, and 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 work on. I don't want to feel this again. So what is it about? this experience that's lighting this up inside of me? Like what, what's lingering in here? And when you get curious about that, then you start to really pick apart the experience and say, well, it's no big deal. I'll just pick up my bike. Uh, I'll put my nutrition back and uh, I'll dust my hands off. And what do I need to do next? I need to go make my lunch, you know, because now I need to prepare for the race tomorrow. So you don't really give it as much attention. And I think that's where this... Um, I don't know this, uh, I guess it's this internal relationship that you're building, that you're uncovering with yourself. You know, it's an uncovering, peeling back the layers of like, what's the essence of who you are? Are you the person who gets angry and upset about things like that? Or are you the person that 
stays focused and, and concentrated on what you need to do next and not sweating, again, the small stuff. Because in the grand scheme of things, you can pick up your bike, you can pick up your nutrition and, uh, and move on. And there's a bigger piece of this that when we stop going down that like extraneous road of uh, expanding anger and victimhood and I've been wronged and things like that, as we starve that of our attention, like, like you said, we feel whatever it is that we feel and then let it move, like just let it go without resistance and let it go without becoming its partner and engaging it and expanding it is that those neural pathways, those behavior patterns begin to fade away. So the extreme reaction that I probably would have had, you know, 15 years ago when something like that happened, I would probably have very little reaction right now or perhaps approach it like, oh, look at that little old test from the universe, you know, or whatever. Like, those things to me are all lessons. They're not hardships. Um, they're less, they're life lessons. They're like, oh, some of them are just like reference points. Like, oh, okay, cool. So that all got knocked down and my bike's all scratched now. I got, I just got an opportunity to see like, where am I, where am I chilling on the vibrational, uh, you know, like realm on the spectrum. Like, where am I chilling? Am I calm? Am, am I unshakable? Or am I getting really shaken by something that in the green scheme of things does not matter whatsoever? So it's pretty cool. I've had an experience recently with really getting a good reference point and it was an injury. Um, and I don't want to go into it too much because I did an episode for season three of Wick Athlete on it, but one of the things I didn't talk about, and perhaps I probably will, because I want to do another episode on it, like kind of being where I am now with it, but about a week and a half ago, it's Thursday, so a week ago, last Tuesday at the pool, all of a sudden my back got really tight. I bent over to stretch it, heard this little voice that said, don't stretch it, and but my intellect said, no, tight back, stretch it, and something just... Whew, something just like let go and it was just hot searing pain and my back was seizing and um I had this grand plan like multi-day grand plan of how I was going to celebrate my birthday and none of it happened I had to let go of all of it we did have the cake except for the cake because it's four layers of frosting like of course um, and to see the voice of dissatisfaction and to see the voice of the ego, you know, kind of being like, oh, I was going to do this amaz amazing, like, trail run on my birthday and have this huge, like, um, output and then eat cake and feel good about it. Now, how are you going to feel about eating cake when, you know, you can barely get down to the beach walking? Um, so it was cool to see that reference point because, I would say a turning point was probably, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know. I feel like it's been gradual. So I don't want to say it was a, a turning point because even, even at the beginning of triathlon, because I was studying the body so much, I was gay. I was gaining so much information about the body that I was just in such awe of the way, the miraculous ways in which it works just inherently. Um, so I feel like I've had a lot of gratitude even throughout, but like the emotion and the crying and the anger or the frustration of having an injury, that stuff has like faded away. And it's so amazing to think that that happens so naturally as a result of sitting on a cushion every morning and getting quiet. And, and why that works is because getting quiet, meaning I'm quieting my body. I'm quieting my mind by focusing the mind on just one thing, not all the things that I have to do in a day, but continually focus it on one thing. And what that does is it drops us into um, a frequency that is aligned with the part of us that's never in the fight which is so cool. So every time you sit in meditation, even if your mind is busy, you're still taking away 
a slice of that non-resistant energy with you as you walk into your day. Like, And even if you just get off the meditation pillow and then you're hell on wheels for the rest of the day, which I don't recommend, like I recommend you take your meditation practice into your life and pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing it and pay attention to how you feel and, and what that attraction point is. Like the power of communing with that in stillness with yourself is so powerful that I don't think there's anything you can do to really thwart the the results. So it's super cool to see how I am able to navigate injury. And Coach Liz and I were talking on the way to the pool today about how fast we move through things now. Like I said to you last night, like this injury could have been like, for, I don't know, like for, for someone, it could have been like season ending. It was pretty bad. And it's amazing how quickly my body has been able to move through it. And the one thing that is really hard to do, which I'm doing right now is sitting, but I can, I could swim. Uh, biking is like, mm, so, so I can run like pain-free, which is so cool. I can walk. Um, but yeah, meditating of all things is like the worst for this final piece of healing that's going on in my back. Which is funny because most athletes listening to this would be like, oh yeah, I don't care if I'm not able to sit and meditate. What? Right? Because, oh my God. <laughs> ah. As long as I can swim, bike and run or do the, uh, the other thing, that's probably I'll the, be okay. And that's the place where I'm feeling like the, oh my God, like, well, up until just a couple days ago when meditator Bob said, why don't you lay down? He's like, you've been doing this long enough where you can lay down. So I started that. And so now I can get back to, I got back to my 45 minutes in the morning, which is great. Pain free. Yeah. It's again, we witness so much from each other, like through these pain injuries, <laughs> opportunities, like we, we watch each other and we just see it. We've seen it too many times to really give it like, undue attention, meaning get involved and immersed in it. You know, I think our initial reaction is like, what can we do? Let's let's start doing it. Usually it's putting heat on and it's probably taking any intensity out of our workouts and sessions and really getting the fuel and juices in and the water in and just, you know, really hyper-focused on that and getting some rest and sleep and maybe taking our days down a little bit and in, in what our commitment level is. So there's all these things that you and I both do as these injuries and opportunities present themselves, but then we always, and I'll use that word always, always return to some form of activity within 24 or 48 hours, like something, mm -hmm. walking Clark at the very least, getting into the pool, even just immersing yourself in the pool. I think you had what, like 15,000 yards? I had like close to 14,000 yards. 14,000 yards. That was my biggest week. And I know there's people listening who are like, they do 15,000 yards every week and they've done it for years, but I've never really worked on my swim. Like I've just kind of gotten in and done the swim. And uh, I don't know, I guess it was about, uh, you know, two to three months ago, I had this hit of like, I wonder what it'd be like if I just swam more. So I guess what I did, I just started to swim more. And it was so perfect because swimming was was actually the only thing besides walking, because you have to walk, like I had to walk around. So walking was kind of a non-negotiable, but I was able to walk to the beach and stuff and and walk slowly. Rarely do I find that that shutting down all movement is helpful. Yes, yes. Stopping. I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's helpful. And it doesn't mean, like I just said, we don't I just we don't take things down a not like a couple of levels. And and continue to do some sort of activity, but just stopping and like, and, and stopping and saying for the next week, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. That I, just doesn't enter my, my awareness. Like no. it's not something I, I believe in because every, and this is the same way you work with our athletes, you included is like, see how you feel tomorrow. And tomorrow morning, you don't feel good. See how you feel in the afternoon. Afternoon doesn't feel good. How do you feel at night? Um, ex, ex, you have 24 hours in a day. There's some, part of that where you're going to feel better than others and you want to capture those moments. And to do that, you need to be fully in capacity of your, of what's happening to you in that moment. Yeah. So swimming felt really good last week. I had hurt myself right before getting in the pool, which was kind of a joke. Cause I was like, 
what do I do? Like, do I go in the pool? And I was like, so I entertain worst case scenario, right? Like worst case scenario is I start seizing up in the pool. Lifeguard has to pull me out. I just lay on the deck while you finish your set, right? Like that's kind of, was kind of worst case scenario. But I just kept th- like something was telling me like, well, oh, the weightlessness. So yeah, I ended up having because swimming and walking were it. Biking was out of the question. Running was out of the question. Meditating was the worst. It was so painful uh, until I got that permission to lie down, which now I'm loving this lying down meditation because I see how lazy the mind wants to be. Because it's five in the morning and I'm lying down with a blanket and a pillow and Clark snuggling next to me and I'm on the floor. I'm not in bed. I'm like on the floor in like the foyer and, um, you know, I've got a yoga mat under me and stuff, but I see how the mind's like, oh yeah, lay down early morning, sun's not up, go back to sleep. And you like, if you, I kind of feel like if you're a dead, if you're a dedicated meditator and you've been doing this for a while, I challenge you to do a lying down meditation. I think you'll see that you got to take your discipline up a notch. It's pretty cool. So yeah. So now I'm loving that and I'm slowly getting back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To seated. But it's really cool to see that, you know, I think these things that get thrown our way in life, they're like, look at where you are with things and and don't be afraid to look at where you are. You know, don't be afraid to look at where you are because it's just you and you, you know, and I was smashing my fist into the wall, like, because I was so frustrated. You know, I remember like one day just like feeling that and being like, whoa, look at where you are. Like, like, how do we get this anger out? Uh, For me, it ended up being meditation was the answer. You know, of course, I think it's the answer. The answer. For everything. For everything. I think uh, injury is such a, (laughs) we've talked about injury so many times and it's, uh, and actually there's a few people on the team experiencing it. So really just feel it. You got to feel, you got to feel it. Be in the suck. Like it don't. I don't feel it's, um, I think optimism is good, but I also, you got to feel what you're feeling. Like, w- what does it feel like to be incapacitated? Like, you can't work out right now. Okay. It feels, you know, I feel rumblings. I feel frustrated. I feel upset. I feel um, lost because I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to that race a couple weeks, months down the road. Uh, but instead, you, once you start to feel that, okay, you feel that. Well, I don't want to feel that. Again, I don't want to feel this ickiness that's happening. I want to feel good. So what does make me feel good? Oh, to what can I do? And you've talked about this many times. Just start writing down what you can do. I'm so grateful I can go to my job and make money. I'm so grateful I can turn the key in my car and drive myself to work. I'm so grateful I have food in the fridge and I can actually feed myself to fuel me throughout the day and get into that appreciation. And it's not easy at first. I know you, you were well beyond me when when um, I had my darkest moment with injury, and I didn't want to be told. You know, I didn't want to be shine the light on on all those things. But you didn't want me to tell you that taking oxy and drinking wine wasn't good. Yeah, I don't even want any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you I'm were doing. like. Don't. I'm like, okay. So I said a little prayer for you instead. <laughs> Thank you. I needed your prayers and everyone else's. Because you're just like, you have zero tolerance, dude. Like, I like. when was the last time you had been on that kind of medication? Long time. Probably my surgeries. <laughs> so it's like, my, oh my God, this could yeah. be a, a cocktail. I might as well like really give him a big hug before he goes to bed. <laughs> yeah. Big learning. <laughs> Do they still give things like that? Like, do they still give think so. like oxy? Like, what was it? Oxycodone? Oxycodone, I think. And some Cabernet? Yeah. We are not recommending this as a solution, no, you guys. No, I would not recommend so it. So somebody goes out and starts mixing this stuff, don't come back to us. And I'm very... We, we recommend sitting with yourself in meditation yes. and getting into a safe space of the part of you that, you know, mm. is never fearful or angry or resistant. Much more fulfilling. It's really cool to growing. think, guys, that that part of us exists and it's within you right now. So if you're in a struggle, know that there's a part of you, like just take a moment right now, close your eyes, take a breath. Can you begin to feel and it might take your imagination. You might have to use your imagination at first. If you're far away from it, use your imagination to feel, to begin to embody that there's this part of you that is unshakable. It's, it's non-moving. It's not changing. I just think you, a lot of us haven't, haven't tapped into that yet. Yeah. It's there. It's there in every one of us. 
Yeah, it's so cool to think. And we just had on a guest, I can't remember, but it was the the reinforcement of having more experiences because through experiences you gain confidence. Back to what we were talking about before. Ashley. Was that uh, Ashley? Ashley Winchester? Yes. Ashley. Yes. That's gonna come out after after this comes out. She's gonna come out, I think, the beginning of April. Great conversation. But have that experience. Like have the experiences that maybe feel uncomfortable at first so that you can get to know this unshakability that's uh, that exists inside of you. We were just recently talking to meditator Bob about like just challenges in life. So we've been talking about injury, but it could be like an emotional challenge, right? It could be a heartbreak. It could be a loss. Like somebody maybe you love has left the earth. Like it could be something like that. And I, and I don't know if you remember this. It was actually before I got injured, which was interesting. Um, but it was not last session, but the session before. And he was saying like how we have this, there's this part of us that's like, oh, I just want it to go away. I just want to feel better. And he's like, no, we shouldn't be like that. Like you really want to feel it. Like take time with it. It's teaching you. It's a lesson. It's not a hardship. It's not because you're less than. It's not because you have bad luck. It's there for you, for you to grow. And so don't like, not that you have to linger in it and keep it around forever, but like be patient with it. Be patient with yourself. And I think that that's grace, right? Be having grace for our process. I remember right before running the Denver Marathon, which was my first marathon, I was out for a run on the South Boulder Creek Trail. And um, I, like my calf just, you know, blew in one of the, you know, the hot searing pain, the whole thing. And uh, I was so angry at first because I was really down on myself at that point in my life, thought I was a crappy runner who always got injured. And guess what? I was a crappy runner who always got injured because it's going to be whatever you believe it to be. And I remember saying to myself, and this was a little bit of a tough love and that's just where I was at the time. And so this worked for me, right? Like, so wherever you are, find what works for you because what works for me might not work for you. You got to find what works for you. And I remember I was like, you've got, I was talking to myself. I was like, you've got two miles to get home. You're going to cry. You're going to be angry. You're going to do whatever you need to do. Scream, like be a little baby, do whatever you need to do. And when you walk in that door, it's done. Let it all go out here. And that was the first time that I really threw down some self-control, like, I guess. I don't know if that's the word I'm using for, but kind of like get it out. And then when you shut the door, after you go in the house, you leave it out, like no more. Now you move into what I would now say is solution energy. Like then you move into healing. But perhaps what I didn't see at that time was that two miles of kicking and screaming was also a part of my healing. So wherever you are, and just you're, you're more powerful than being lost. So find in those moments what works for you because you are capable of finding that. It's inherently baked into you. Yeah. Don't, don't wish it away. Don't wish it to move too quickly. Yeah, it, learn from it. Actually, that you know that's draws parallels to our trip across the country, where we were at one point trying to get, wanting to be further along in the trip than where we were, whatever state town we were in. And we both had that moment where we were just like, no, just we just need to experience this place, so that we know, so that we know what our relationship with is, it, whether we come back or not. Like we've had the experience. We weren't trying to rush through to get to the West Coast as soon as possible. That's why it took us six months and 7,000 miles <laughs> to get across the country. I love that it took 7,000 miles to drive like 3,000 miles. I love that too. <laughs> but we had to, had to slow down and experience it, really soak it up. I think, I think it's challenging, I'll speak for myself, as athletes to slow down. You know, I, I, as a yoga teacher too, as I listen to the breath in class and teaching new students, it's like this constant, like, let's move. I feel the energy to like move on to the next thing when we just get so much more uh, depth and expansiveness when we really settle in for long periods of time and really in yoga 
for example, the breath, just really feel these breaths in all the way up to the top, right? And then all the way out. So you're, you're, for once in your entire day, you're actually manually choosing when to breathe in and when to breathe out when it's automatic most often and we don't even think about it. So yeah, I think a slowing down um, is is pretty powerful. And that's uh, Ashley Winchester talks about that too. Like one of the biggest learnings she had from nature, being out in nature was slowing down, even though she's trying to get all these fastest known times, which I love that. Well, there's, that, um, yeah, but contrast. there's so much truth around that. And she's experiencing it through running and her connection to nature. I've experienced it through just being mindful in my life is that as we slow down, we actually speed up. Because we're more efficient, we're more exact, we're more true in our words. There's less spending time, like think about all the time that's just spent regretting, rehashing, um, you know, I think rehashing kind of just says it all, like rehashing how much time. So as we're present in a moment and taking action, speaking words, um, we're actually speeding up the rhythm of our life because we're, we're not, we don't have all this time that's being wasted in the rehash or the rehearse, which is what you were doing prior to those. I used to do that too. Dude, I used to do that with fights. Like, Oh, you would play it all out? Oh yeah. I would go in there and I was really good. I always thought like I should be an actress because I like remember my fight that I'm going to throw down. And it was in, Oh, yuck. But yeah, I used to do that and I would come out victorious. Um, and, um, yeah, and gosh, the other person, so sorry. You know, typically it was my high school boyfriend, <laughs> such a nice guy. Um, but yeah, I used to rehearse stuff. Uh, but not, not just in like, uh, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, but like bosses and, things like that. I was like a rehearse queen. And then, pro- you know, with that rehash, which is all ego, ego is rehearsing and rehashing. And it's, it's what I found is it's not who I am. Who I am is not memorization and rehearsing and all that. Who I am is me and, and, and me is showing up in at, at this moment and then this moment and this moment. And I, and I trust, you had mentioned trust or like, I trust that whatever presents itself is exactly what's supposed to present itself. And it's actually more fulfilling, I've found, uh, over the past few years, through training, through conversations, through all experiences, being with family, like just trusting that me is me. And I'm uncovering who me is. And to rehearse and memorize and all of those things that we do to prepare ourselves to control the situation and the outcome just doesn't really doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. Back to feeling good. I don't feel good when that happens. I feel nervous. I feel anxious. I feel fearful, doubt. I'd never have gone to a presentation or a meeting or or a review with notes and rehearsing and felt great. I've always had this edge of like, like, like what's happening? Like what, what could, what could happen here? I don't, I don't know. Whereas <laughs> it's like a prison. That's terrible. But when I just let things flow yeah. and it just, it's natural. I don't attach to what the outcome is. I just know that it's for my best interest. I trust back to, I just trust. And you got to be willing. I think this is also, yeah. you know, goes for setting big goals and doing big things with our athletics is like, you got to be willing to like blow up and go oh, in, and go in there and you know and and this is gold in our yoga teacher training was I remember one of the exercises we had is we'd call a pose so let's say like triangle pose and we'd have them the whole class so you got like you know 25 people in triangle pose and you, and the and the deal is you d- it's 3 minutes and it's silence unless words come Okay. So it's this really, really fine silk thread line of planning something, like, like thinking about what you're going to say and saying it, or just from the silence, the words rise and they flow from present moment. Meaning if somebody said, what did you just say? You'd be like, oh my God, did I just say something? Like, 
I, I don't know what I just said. And so, and he, and then Philip would always be able to tell, like, I would, you know, you'd say something like, you know, I have no idea, but totally be able to tell when it's contrived and when it's not contrived. And so the point of that exercise, uh, maybe was humility. Um, but I think the primary point of that exercise was tr- learning to trust the present moment, that the words will come not a moment too soon, which the mind hates, the conditioned mind, and not a moment too late. Everything comes right on time. And oh man. And so that's the that's what we're talking about when we're talking about like trust in self is really like trust in that moment. Trust of the present moment. So you're talking about the teacher's perspective of being in a class and wanting to say something to interrupt the silence, to do something versus sitting and waiting. I'm just clarifying as a teacher, not from the student's perspective. As yeah, a teacher. Oh yeah, as a teacher. And you're watching 25 people now holding a pose and sensation is building and they're getting fidgety and you're just, you want to save them, but that's not your job. Right. Our job was to see them as capable. And what I was learning was how to speak from the present moment. And this is what, this is what I learned also when I went to teacher training and just as referring to Philip and Renee from Live, Love, Teach and Rhode Island Power Yoga. And that's the essence of what they teach. They teach, they teach how to teach a class, not the, the poses. The poses are part of it. I don't want to say they don't do that. But the focus is on actually being able to stand up in front of 25 yogis and prepare them to be in triangle pose for three minutes. That is the work that, um, that I always put, I always, it's what I gravitated to with this type of, of teacher training. And I, I realized soon now that I think about it when I went to your class four to five times a week, <laughs> your specific class, I wouldn't go to anybody else again, a hard line, but, um, but yeah, you would say stuff in class and I'd be waiting for you because I took the class and students would come up to you and say like, well, what did you say about this? And they want to write it down or remember it. And I would say nine times out of 10, you just, your response was, I don't, I don't know what I said. I can't remember what I said. And the student just wants to hear, like hear it again. But it was, it was, it came in in a flash. Well, because the intellect in wants to grab onto it. Right. Cause I think it's trust, right? It wants to grab onto it because we don't trust that whatever we like. So whatever we hear in a moment, like what resonates, like trust that like if it resonates with us, that means we, we are embodying it. Whoa. What'd you just do? Are you okay? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're like stroking out. That was weird. Your eyes like oh, rolled God. up. <laughs> well, I was just equating Ooh. it. I don't want to interrupt you. Are you done with that? Yeah, go. But the same thing in the pool with the watch. You, you don't trust that your times and the yardage that you're doing without a watch is actually happening. So you need the watch so that you have that visual cue so that you see it. You actually see it. Oh, I've hit 130 is on the 100, right? Versus what we did today where we just read the clock over and over again. We didn't have a watch. But you know and trust that you did 5,000 yards and you did them on whatever the intervals were, Right. Yes. So the very thing that we're talking about, like the mind wants to hang on to that. Oh, the watch data says it shows it right here. Whereas what you actually put into training peaks, let's wrap this around to athletes, is you just typed in 5,000 yards and you put in the notes, whatever. You know, we left on, you know, 24 of them on 155 and you just went through that. There's no real data for every single 100 that you did. Right? There's no data at all. So the watch trust. was you well, my watch was on the counter at home. Right. But this is the whole this is what I love so much about removing that. Well, that is this like if a piece of technology if a tree remember. falls in the wood and no one sees it, yeah. d- does it? Yep. Like did that swim happen? I don't know. It's in the past. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You trust that I'm feeling something happen. Like, like if I feel that, like <laughs> I definitely <laughs> feel the after five thousand swim, like uh if I laid down to meditate right now, I'd probably fall asleep. Um, hey, something I want to touch upon. Wow, we've been riffing. I don't even know what we've been talking about. I'm excited to listen to this again. <laughs> I hope there's something uh, in there, a couple pieces of gold for you guys to take away. Um, we're just sharing from our experience. You know, we're just living in a way that 
we feel is transparent. Um, we have goals. We love to be competitive. Uh, you know, I'm 50 years old, so there's things, you know, I've got a lot of miles on this body and I'm navigating lots of sensation and, um, not lots of sensation, but maybe recently. Yes. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that I hope this is helpful for people. I believe it is. And conversations happen like this a lot for us because we just pull on threads as we strike up topics. But in this community of Yogi Triathlete, again, it's not that we want to save everyone out there from the experiences that they're meant to have, but but I feel like we can shine a light on possibilities and maybe questioning beliefs or patterns that you have developed throughout your training or you know existence up to this point. And if we can just have this conversation and something, you know, something like strikes, you know, a lightning moment like it did for me where I started to look in the my eyeballs went to the back of my head. Then maybe you can pull on that a little bit and begin to implement something in your life that maybe you didn't think could happen or um, or maybe you never even just thought of. Yeah, never yeah. thought of. So it's not about saving you from all these experiences. Well, oh no, you're going to have experiences right. and some of them are going to hurt <laughs> really gonna, bad. Some are going to And you're really 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 going to want them to pass really quickly, but but um we encourage you to absorb them uh or I should say don't absorb them, but like let them rise and let them move and and learn from them because they're they're for you. It's all for you. Um, now speaking of experiences, we were kind of talking about this. So, so I'm coming back, um, you know, from this, this really acute injury and, uh, you know, one of the other things on the bucket list was, you know, do this five peaks challenge, which is 19 miles, about 4,600 feet of climbing. And although I was still able to walk about 15 miles last week, like i just got back into running this week. And I said to you this morning, like, you know, because my ego likes it too. I was like, am I strong enough to do this? And of course I know the answer is yes, but sometimes we like to hear that outside voice, especially from our loved ones. But something that I think is so brilliant that you've been shining a light on as us athletes, like perhaps are coming off an injury or something, and then they're going to do something crazy, like a 19 mile trail run with 4,600 feet of climbing, um, you know, five days after they, they started running again. Uh, me, or that they're going to go out and do some, you know, uh, I don't know, some other kind of epic thing where on paper, perhaps it doesn't really make sense. But the thing, the light that I like you shining on is this idea of like, you said to me this morning, yes, of course you're strong enough, but at what cost? And and we're going to find that out. So I am willing to find that out, right? Like I, it might, you know, might fire things up in my body at what cost. And so as we do these things, like if we're leading up to an Ironman and we're like, I have to run a marathon, the coach is like, yeah, but your mileage doesn't, you know, and you say, I'm going to do it anyway. And you go out and maybe do a secret training day where you just completely go What's rogue. What's secret training? I don't, what? A secret people tra- secret train? <laughs> yeah. I've heard that people do secret <laughs> <They> training. Do. <laughs> um and you go out and you do this marathon, it's completely rogue and all of that. I think that that's not wrong. But I think a piece to take into consideration is this idea that BJ has brought in, this curiosity of like, are you are you willing to step into whatever the cost of that is? Yeah, and the dramatic, big... Um big thing that's just waiting for you that we can talk about is injury. You know, if you do something big and epic, like what's the cost? Well, a potential injury, but there's other costs. Like what is the cost of, what is the cost of doing something like that for your continued training towards the actual race that you're doing? You know, the consistent training that you've built and worked so hard for to throw it out by doing this big epic experience and then have to shut your body down or shut training down for a few days. Like at what cost are these workouts? That's what I feel really passionate and and strong about in your experience too. Of course you're strong. I know you can do this, this hike and, and run 19 miles for sure. 
on paper, it would say, absolutely do not do this because look at your mileage from the past few weeks um, going into this um, opportunity that you had in the body and, and you're recovering. But also, what, is, what does it say on paper for you for the past 20 years? You know, let's look at the consistency you've had year after year, day after day. And these are just little blips, what you're experiencing, what you ha- did experience or have been experiencing in the past few days. Just a little blip that says, ah, we just need to adjust things a little bit. But in the grand scheme of things, you, for example, Jess, the athlete, your consistency and strength and durability has been pretty profound, like pretty, pretty solid. So to say, and this is very unique, right? It's, it's specific to you. Again, we're going to take you as the special person that you are, unique person that you are, spirit that you are, is on Saturday when we go to do this experience, I have no doubts that it could potentially, I have no doubts that it can be everything you want it to be. And, and we're going to crush 19 miles and you're going to feel great. I've seen it too many times from you. I've seen it way too many times for myself. But we're only going to know when we get there in that moment. So for you to say, based on what's happened over the past few days, I'm not going to give Saturday a try. You know, people are coming out to meet us. Uh, there's other things I could be doing. Uh, my back just isn't feeling right. Like, none of those things matter. What matters is let's just go lace up and put ourselves on that trail at 5.30 a.m. and start. You guys keep trying to get, make it later. I want to be on the trail by 5. Oh, on the trail by 5. <laughs> Which means we're going to have to wake up at like 3.30. It's going to be an early espresso morning. I like those mornings. I know you do. That's yeah. why I threw that in there. But that's, it's what cost? Like, is it, and being okay with, being okay with that cost, detaching from, okay, well, I went out and I did these five peaks and guess what? I'm, I'm in bed now for another week. I know that you're okay with that. Like, I understand that because in that moment you made the decision, you were feeling good and you didn't, you didn't worry about what was going to happen on Sunday or Monday. Well, yeah, 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 getting yeah. Getting too far So ahead. just being really in that conscious mind to make decisions and when we're in that conscious mind, when we make decisions, we're present. And when we're present, we have all our faculties. We're really at our best. Um, so that if doubt comes in, if fear comes in, it's like, mm, yeah, but in that, in that moment, I was, yeah, I was very sure on this decision. And I am sure on this decision. And we're going to show up and we're going to do, we're going to take a f- the first step and we're going to see how it goes. I have a feeling it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, and, and just whatever that is, whatever, whatever that looks like in training peaks at the end of the day, because I will have my watch on. Um, I think it's going to be I, the feeling that I have is we're going to have a blast. I, I believe so, too. And I think your belief is everything. What you believe to be is, is pretty powerful. I did want to say on these epic adventures, like it's an ebb and flow. So in this experience right now, you're feeling like Saturday is going to be great, right? Fun. Fun. Flow. (laughs) Flow. Maybe in six months from now, a year from now, six years from now, it'll be a different week. You'll be having different goals, different experiences, and maybe this different timing, because you're doing this because it's your birthday, different timing, maybe the decision is slightly different. So you're not attached to, okay, well, this time it works, so I'm definitely going to be fine when I do it again. It's playing each moment separately. Well, that would be and glory day. That would be like <laughs> that would be living the glory yes. days. Well, last year when I did this, um, we talked about the glory days on the last O show. But yeah, and I think, and also for me going into this confidence, uh, I have great confidence in whatever decisions I make as we go along that day. And also, there's other people there that are going to need to make decisions for themselves. That. The, the biggest, the biggest like bang of confidence comes from, I've been consistent for 17 years, 16 years. I don't even know. And even before that we were, you know, doing the gym thing and the Stairmaster. And even before that I was doing the Reebok step and the, you know, the slide and all that stuff. So I've been active my whole life, but since triathlon and ultra running, like I've listened to my coach, I've followed the plan. I haven't really fought back on that stuff too much. Um, I've just executed and I've been consistent for almost two decades. And so, yeah, I've got the confidence that, you know, but if, 
if you're an athlete that's not consistent, if you're all or nothing, if you're high and low and you're going to go out and do this epic thing, your decision to go do it is not wrong. It's not wrong, but be very aware of like there may be, there will be, right? Cause and effect. We live, this is scientific law, cause and effect, that there will be a cost. And so are you okay with what that cost is? Because if you're not okay with it, then you start fighting it. Then maybe you doubt the decision that you made. You think the decision was wrong. You're beating yourself up. And none of this is really moving you in that direction of, you know, come full circle in this conversation to belief in self and trust, which is um, monumental. It's really, really important in, in your ability to succeed. And, and also to have ease, like we can have ease in our life. Like it, but if we believe that the only way that we're going to be able to achieve anything in our life or make a lot of money in our life is through hard work, then that is actually the only way we're going to ever be able to achieve those things. But if we start to lean into more ease, more flow, you realize that with the truth that everything is energy our journey here in this life and our success and and money and and ease it's it's really more of a an emotional and an energetic journey than it is a hard work physical journey well said yeah more ease if you want to tie this into racing yes these big epic punches oh i also wanted to you mentioned the, the all or nothing. Like there's a there's a pattern forming. If you're all or nothing, there's a pattern forming. And if you go out and do epic workouts, there's probably a reason why you're constantly doing all or nothing because then you come down and you probably went too hard. I, I like to I like to say you should finish a workout being able to most certainly work out the next day. Absolutely, there should there shouldn't be really a need to to take a big full rest day off. In my opinion, with the kind of training we do. So I would rather see, so if we're looping this into racing, you want to get to the, you want to get to the starting line. How can you best get to the starting line? Consistency and ebbing and flowing ever so slightly, maybe going up a little bit and, and recovering and going up a little bit and recovering consistently versus having major, you know, let's just call it weekend workouts. And then you do nothing during the week. Um, really big opportunity for stuff to happen uh, in the body and show up and not allow you to get to that starting line. So I think when you loop it into racing and if racing is really something that you're, you know, you enjoy doing, wouldn't you want to do everything possible to get to that starting line? And I think what happens is, yes, you want to get to that starting line, but then we begin, the ego tends to get in there and says, well, I need to do, I need to get super strong and fit to get to that starting line. And that's where the self-regulation really comes in. Being able to understand you, maybe you don't need to do 20 100s, maybe just 10 100s are good right now and gives you enough dose of fitness to get you to the next day and the next day and the next day. Because it's this stacking day after day after day that really builds a foundation and and you shouldn't say hardening of the body, but uh, uh, an awareness in the body that it can do it can do things every day. It, it's building strength and durability. Um, and when you do the inconsistent training and you do the highs and lows, the body doesn't really know what is true and what is not true. So it may show up sometimes and it may not show up other times. It, it, there's no consistency. So if we loop this into racing, I would say, hands down, you know, 30 consistent days of doing like something easy every day to get to the start line is a great way, place to start not going out and doing, you know, one day of eight hours of training and then the next day, nothing. And the next day, nothing. And then the next day, six hours of training. Yeah. And that, that kind of feast or famine mindset is going to, is going to be throughout, like throughout your life. You're going to have high highs, low lows, right? Yeah. It's the theme. It's the theme that you're yeah. creating, whether you're conscious of it or not, it could just be a pattern. Yeah. And the path of the path of yoga, the science of the mind, it's the metal path. It's the one that's like just kind of cruising along, like, you know, and the people on, on the fast lane are like whizzing by and you're like, oh, 
they're whizzing by. That kind of looks like fun. But then you realize like, then, you know, they have a red light and you've got a green light and you just keep going. Then you're like, oh, that's so weird because now I'm in front of them. <laughs> right? And then you see the other ones where they're, you know, chilling and got the clicker and it's Netflix and they're binging. And you're like, oh, that kind of looks nice too. But then you realize that like very soon you turn around, you can't even see that person because you keep moving forward and they're still on the couch with the clicker. So it's the middle road. And in the middle road doesn't mean that you don't have fun. It doesn't mean that you won't have you won't have anger. You still have all those great things, um, but you'll have less of that uh, that roller coaster ride of life, which creates a lot of stress. Um, and uh, and it doesn't mean apathy. It 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 means that you care very deeply, but um, you're also just really sure footed in the way that you're moving through life. Um, and I think that it. For me, that did not rise to the surface and become a major player in my life until I sat my butt down, yeah, and closed my eyes and shut my mouth and didn't move for a series of moments every day. It all comes back to meditation. Oh, I know. It Training does. the mind. Yo- I, Thanks I, for bearing with us, guys. <laughs> science of the mind. I love yoga. Like You said that a couple of weeks ago, and I always kind of knew that, but it's really... It's the science of the mind. Science of the mind. So really focusing in on like breathing and awareness. And and, and if the- you look at the teachings of yoga, which are thousands of years old, and you look at modern science, um, it's, modern science is catching up. It's catching up to what these sages were saying and these yogis were saying. This is, you know, Indian spirituality. This is science. Spirituality is science. And it's really cool to see modern science, material science, they're catching up. It's really cool. Um, so I like to go to the ancient science because it's so funny because it's thousands of years old, but it's it's also thousands of years ahead. It's kind of a mind bender. Hmm. Let people ponder on that. Yeah. All right, cool. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. That's fun. That was a good one. Yeah. I love not knowing where things are going to go and... Here we go. And here we go. I go. All right. What do you guys want to hear about? Drop us questions. Um, or if you're just liking the, uh, the open and honest, uh, flow of our conversation, we'll keep doing that, but we're going to keep showing up consistently. <laughs> and we're going to be at Oceanside <laughs> yeah. April 2nd. So if you are planning to come and with BJ's dad, spectate and race or all of it, all of the above or just come out and have fun, uh, let us know. Clark will be there. My dad will be there. I'll be spectating. Beej will be racing. Clark will be spectating. Uh, Clark's not racing. No, Joy Boy. But the Joy Boy will be there. So yeah. we're thinking about getting him a mucho, mucho Joy Boy short, shirt. What do you guys but, think about that? Yeah, Ted. That is for the Ted Lasso. Fans Ted Lasso there. fans. You'll know what we're talking about. Mucho, mucho Joy Boy. I think it'd be pretty cool, cute. Yeah. All right. Well, when Clark wakes up, we'll ask him about it. All right, you guys, we'll catch you next month. See ya.